very distinguished members of this audience, my beloved students, and all other guests present in this great stadium. This is the 90-year-old man who was introduced to you by our friend from Andhra Pradesh this morning. At my age of 90, I claim that every day I put in more hours of work than any of you students here. Not only that, I do some things which I did at the age of 19. Don't ask me the details. <laughs> People have often asked me, what is the secret? I want to share that reply with you because I hope you will remember it when you come of my age and use the same prescription. <laughs> Have you heard of the great King Solomon in ancient history? Solomon, my boys, has left a prescription for eternal youth. When I mentioned it to once upon a time my Prime Minister, he looked at me and I looked at him. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, you don't have a very clean mind. I know what you think Solomon has left. Solomon has not left a drug. Solomon has left a lesson. Oh, he said, but what lesson? The lesson that Solomon has left, that the older you get, the younger should be your company. Again, my Prime Minister had a somewhat confused look. So I looked at him and again told him that I follow the teaching of Solomon religiously. That is why I go to the colleges and teach. That keeps me young. And my young friends, now that you have invited me to this manthan ceremony, I must tell you that after I go back from here this afternoon, I will go back home at least five years younger, if not more. <laughs> there is one thing about me that I never refuse an invitation to go and address audiences where the young will be present. But the only qualification the only condition that I put on my hosts is that please do not restrict my freedom of speech. I speak what I want to, I speak from my conscience, and I do not mind whether it hurts, whether it pleases anybody. Let me first talk to you about something which happened during the freedom movement. Our freedom movement was also inspired by the very same subjects that you are discussing today in the year 2013. There was poverty, there was malnutrition, there were women's bondage, 
and all the ills that today ail India, they existed. But our political leaders at that time preached to us that it is the foreign colonial ruler who is responsible for all our ailments. And once he goes, the wealth of India shall remain in India. And India will be prosperous and rivers of milk and honey will flow throughout the length and breadth of India. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we did get our freedom. But despite more than 60 years of freedom, <clears throat> the same problems with which the freedom leaders grappled continue to exist in a somewhat more accentuated form, in a more terrible form, in a form in which they cause consternation and grief. And I am quite sure that there must be some people in whose minds the thought must be running that was independence worth. But ladies and gentlemen, it was worth. Independence first brought us the democratic method of our political organization, a government supposed to be by the people, for the people, by the people and for the people. And what? What third? Right. You are clever. So ladies and gentlemen, but this democracy that we have inherited is a priceless gift for the maintenance of which you doubtless need some intellectual and moral equipment. First of all, democracy requires the highest amount of education. Democracy and the democratic business is like a flourishing business where the owner of the business is dummy and the manager that he employs is a clever man. It will last for a while, but ladies and gentlemen, inevitably a day will come when the manager will become the owner and the owner will turn into an insolvent. You are the owners of Indian democracy. And therefore, you have to be more educated than those who rule us. If that does not happen, and unfortunately it has not happened, democracy is in a bad shape today. Democracy without education is hypocrisy without limitation. I am glad that you are pursuing education, but my young friends, pursuit of education requires industry. Work apace, 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 for honest labor wears a lovely face. When you are prepared to put in that amount of work which I today put in at the age of 90, you will perhaps be strengthening the pillars and the foundations of Indian democracy. <clears throat> the second feature of democracy is that democracy is like a swimming pool. If you don't periodically change water, that swimming pool becomes a stinking cesspool. And I have come to tell you, without delivering a long lecture, that the democracy in this country has already turned into a stinking cesspool, and it is time that the youth now take care of it. There are people in this country who wish to perpetuate themselves in power and to continue to dominate this cesspool. 
they will tell you that please tell us where do you have water which is purer don't listen to them the stinking pool of today contains that kind of turbid water that kind of stinking and poisonous water which cannot possibly be replicated anywhere else any water that you put in that now will be purer than the one that is filling that fresh pool and i want you young today to make a pledge here and now that you are going to clean up this fresh pool and convert it into another swimming pool that we expected to happen at the end i now want you to draw another lesson from history our great leaders assured us that when the colonial thief disappears our wealth will remain in our pockets and we shall be rich why has that not happened what does what this one circumstance tell you about what is happening in this country i don't think that you require too much of common sense to answer this question my friends isn't the answer very obvious that when the colonial thief is gone there is a more powerful domestic thief who continue to do what the colonial power used to do somebody is stealing the country's wealth the wealth which was taken from your parents maybe your grandparents but the wealth which in reality by the law of succession belongs to you you all of you who are present here you are the owners of that stolen wealth and my friends at the age of 90 i do often feel that i am sitting in the departure lounge of an airport waiting the for the flight to be called but that flight has been delayed it has been delayed by the blessings of some people who like me and it has certainly certainly been delayed by the good wishes of the young of this country for whom i live now i will talk to you about the subject which you have after great deliberation picked up for this month and meeting namely money and the muscle power and how to reduce the effect and influence and the morbid and dirty influence of money and man power in the running of the democratic apparatus in this country i will talk to you after a while about it but ladies and gentlemen and my young friends i want you to know another thing which our democracy and our constitution brought us our constitution boasts of being a secular constitution i regret to say that not many politicians in this country know what the word secular means secularism has today become a word of abuse i am secular but my opponent is communal that is the refrain and the use of secularism and i regret to say that unless the young in this country understand what india secularism means 
India will never make any progress. And this great secularism which we have created in the Indian constitution will be a lost heritage. My friends, secularism is opposed to what is called the theocratic state. A religion dominated state. A state in which the state has a religion. Our founding fathers were great historians. They were students of history. They have drawn all lessons from the history of the past. And ladies and gentlemen, one thing which history taught was the conflict between religion and science. Not any prophet of religion, and I mean no disrespect to anyone, ever knew that there are germs and bacteria which cause disease. Not one. Call me irreligious if you like. I am not a great respecter for religion. I like the religious freedom of anyone who wants it. But speaking for myself, I am a critic of religion. And religion has done immense harm in spite of the fact that it has done some good to some people. It has doubtless done some good to those who have exploited religion for their own ends. It has also done some good to those frustrated, forlorn, those who are the victims of political and social injustice, to the women of this country, to other sufferers from malnutrition and disease, to them perhaps when they find that there is no solace left in this planet, they may expect something in afterlife and religion has brought them some kind of hope or some kind of a ray of hope for the future, however irrational and unfounded that hope be. But everything like every individual must ultimately be judged upon a balance sheet. Ladies and gentlemen and my young friends, religion throughout history has been an enemy of science. When religion said that all disease is caused by sin, medical science refused to develop. No development took place in medical science until the dark ages came to an end after the year nearly about 15, 1600. You know what used to happen in the inquisition which came after Christianity developed sway in this world? How many women were burned on the estates in the Inquisition? They were called witches. You will not believe it that men used to go and give evidence before the Inquisition court, before the clergy's court, and say that we did see this woman actually flying in the air with her head down, with her legs up, with a broomstick, and so on and so forth. And the courts used to find them guilty and thousands and thousands of women were burnt on the Inquisition stakes. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what religion produced. I don't wish to comment more upon this. There were a scientist called Bruno, one of the greatest scientists of that time. He was called by the Inquisition and told that please disown all your scientific discoveries. The man said, no, that great scientist Bruno was also burnt along with the women witches. This is what religion has, ladies and gentlemen, done. Fortunately, fortunately, after Christianity, there came Islam, a mis much misunderstood religion of the world. My young friends, particularly those who are Muslims here, should know the glory of Islam and the glory of the Prophet of Islam. It is that one Prophet who told his followers that when you walk in search of knowledge, 
you are walking in the path of God. It is one prophet who told his followers that the ink of the scholar is more valuable than the blood of a martyr. There were 36 public libraries in the city of Baghdad. A Muslim scholar was invited by the Khalifa to go and live in his palace. He said, no sir, I won't come. He said, why don't you come? He, he said, no sir, don't press me to come to the palace. Ultimately, the, on pressure, he answered that question. He said, sir, if I have to come to your palace, I need 400 camels to transport my library. That was the glory of Islam. When Islam conquered practically the whole of Europe, the whole of the Roman Empire, the whole of the Persian Empire. But my friends also remember that that glorious achievement of Islam came to an end in the 13th century when you found a stupid Khalifa who ordained that all books must be burned except the Holy Quran. From that day onwards, all Muslim states became the slaves and the conquered colonies of the very European powers whom you had educated, whom you had civilized, whom you had brought out from the dark ages of Europe. And that darkness still continues with its greatest and the most dark manifestation now by a new kind of a religion which I refuse to associate with the great religion of Islam but it is Osama bin Ladism that I call it. And today, ladies and gentlemen, those who are in power, out of their desire for vote banks, will not even criticize this Obamaism, this bin Ladenism that I call it, which is the recall of the dark ages of Europe again, the dark ages are coming back again unless the intellectuals in this country, the secular intellectuals in this country do something. And my friends, secularism is the greatest gift for a pluralistic society. We have allowed everybody not only to profess and practice his religion, but we have also given them the third right which they claimed in the Constituent Assembly. In the Constituent Assembly debates, it is the Muslim members and the Christian members who said that we are not happy with merely professing and practicing our religion. We also want the third right of propagating our religion. Ambedkar and Nehru opposed it. They said, don't take this dangerous right. They insisted. And Nehru and Ambedkar accepted the challenge and said, all right, we will put the third word also. You have professed, practiced, and propagate your religion. Thank God they didn't talk about propagating children. They were still talking about propagating religion. So my friends, having given that right to everybody, our clever statesmen that sat in that great galaxy, of Constituent Assembly members, they said that this right will be subject, subject to three things, public health, public order, and public morality. Now please understand the implications of Indian secularism. This Indian secularism is a better secularism than the secularism of the Americans and other European states. We have given religion, we have given religious practice, but we have said that it will be subject to public order, public health and morality. The implication of this is that there are certain religious practices, there are certain religious beliefs, there are certain religious rituals which are inconsistent with morality, which are inconsistent with health and which are inconsistent with order. How will you resolve the conflict? 
the conflict can only be resolved not by the scripture which you challenge but it will be resolved by the small little mammalian equipment which providence has given us namely the human brain all conflicts the subjection of religion and the uselessness of religion shall be decided by this human brain and let me summarize to you in two sentences what india's secularism means india's secularism means and it ordains and it dictates and mandates a life a life which is controlled and guided by reason and logic at the same time inspired by this great dynamo this great dynamo of love compassion and charity a life guided by logic but inspired by love is the message of indian secularism under the indian constitution you will never forget this great message and this great gift when you grow up the secular spirit in you must grow still stronger and indefatigable and not be subjected to any kind of stupid propaganda of others and i have heard so many subjects being discussed by these delegations that came before us and presented their talented view points i don't propose to deal with any of these except two of them two of them i want to touch one is women's empowerment i like that discussion i like it very much but i am afraid that women are not being educated properly about the superiority of their gender you are 50% of the population why are you taking this goody of 33% it is again it is again a part of the male deception which has brought poor women to this condition in this country i want women to remember the history of women civilization man was a hunter he was a nomadic tribe he hunted and wherever he went he killed the animal he slept there he fornicated there he produced babies there it is women who made civilization possible woman made civilization possible because she is the first person who built the first humble cottage she is the first person who tilled the first field and it is woman who started domesticating wild animals and my women friends here please remember that man was the last wild animal which woman domesticated that wild animal has managed again to put you in a state of subjection why and how in the hindu pantheon of the past there were no male gods there were only 12 goddesses but when society grew up into a male dominated society each goddess got married <laughs> slowly the man god became important almost all the female goddesses disappeared from the pantheon and the only goddess which has retained her sovereignty which has retained her male gen her gender superiority is the goddess durga worshiped as kali in the eastern parts of the world i want all women i want all women of this country to become durgas and kalis
and you will see the end of male domination. Then there was a debate, a presentation on malnutrition. All that you said about malnutrition in this country is again the result of poverty. But please do not be misguided. Do not be misguided by these election stunts called the Food Security Act. Five kilos of grain is not food. Food is not grain. Food is grain plus vitamins. It is plus vitamins, plus ghee, plus butter, plus cooking oil, plus some condiments to make it palatable. Every, every healthy male Every healthy male requires at least 2,000 calories per day. This five kilos of grain produce not more than 500 to 550 calories per day. They have stolen your money. They have stolen your money and now they want to give you this kind of a slap to put you to sleep, to put your doubts to sleep. You will forget that it is your stolen money with which they are going to buy this grain and give it to you in small bits. That, ladies and gentlemen, takes me to this topic which you have selected with great wisdom. Money and muscle power. Yes, money and muscle power go together except in the case of some very non-violent, peaceful creatures, undoubtedly money gives you the power and the capacity and the ability to employ muscle men and to do what? To frighten the very persons whose money you have stolen. And my friends, this is your money. And when I told you that while I am waiting for the delayed flight to take place someday, I have made one pledge to myself. I have no desire to be a Prime Minister of this country. I am more qualified than many. I said, I said, I am more qualified than many, but except one. Without any instigation, with this small little mammalian equipment, I surveyed the political scene, and having surveyed it, I installed him in the ministerial, prime ministerial chair right first in my brain and then in my heart. But I may have given up all political ambitions of any kind, but I have one ambition left that I shall retrieve the 1500 billion dollars of stolen money which have been stolen from this country. If, if this money is brought back and distributed in India, every Indian family will get at least 3 lakh rupees. My friends, this is stinking swimming pool of a government or a cesspool of a government have done nothing to get this money. 
Now, this money, everybody knows. Now there is international documentation that this money is lying in foreign banks, particularly the Swiss banks. But my friends, if it was Ram Jethmalani's money, if it was my friend Arun Jaitley's money, <laughs> by now we both would have been arrested. By now we would have been both of us in jail. They are sending to jail innocent people, even otherwise. And if there was evidence of guilt of Ram Jethmalani or any other friend of mine, surely we would have been in jail. Now ask, I am asking you, I am taxing your common sense as young students. Why do you think they have got the names? And I'll tell you that they have got the names. Take it from me that they have got the names. Why are they not disclosing them? It's quite obvious. It's quite obvious that the monies are in the accounts of those very people who are ruling us. The Germans, I am under pressure now to finish my speech. I will, I will, I will doubtless oblige. But not until I have said the last word about this black money. My friends, the Germans who are a richer nation than us, they were worried about the secret accounts of some Germans in the foreign banks. What did they do ultimately? Ultimately, they went and paid a bribe of 475 billion dollars to an employee of one of the Swiss banks, the Liechtenstein Bank. And that employee gave them a whole video cassette, and, sorry, an audio cassette containing the names of the scoundrels, the thieves, and the decoys of the alt of the world, the majority of whom are Indians, I'm ashamed to say. The German government made an announcement that we are prepared to give the names to any government which wants these names without condition, without cost. If I was the Prime Minister of this country, I would have taken the first flight to Germany and got back those names. Why is it not done? I went, I gave up my gown and my bands, which I wear in court as a counsel. I went as a petitioner to the Supreme Court of India. After a long one year's hearing, the Supreme Court made an order, delivered a judgment, in which they castigated this government for having taken no steps to recover this money. If this government was not consisting of stinking decoys, it would have resigned. It did not. The second order that the Supreme Court made at our instance was that we are now appointing a special investigation team headed by two retired Supreme Court judges to get back this money. That order has not yet been complied with. And I am now going to move the Supreme Court of India for sending to jail these contemptuous decoys who refuse to follow even the Supreme Court's orders. I am, I am appearing as a petitioner in those cases. But my young friends, I go there with the knowledge that I have your good wishes and your blessings 
and I am your lawyer. If I do not succeed, you will have failed. And I don't believe that the young people of India are going ever to fail. And thank you. Mr. Jait Marani, you keep saying you're 90 years old, but I don't think we've ever seen a 90-year-old with so much energy, so much enthusiasm, and such a spring in his step. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the most powerful, incredible, Thank you, sir.